Good afternoon for some of us and good morning to others that might be joining from the West Coast. I'm Adrian Denenberg. I'm Senior Director of Engagement Initiatives for uh, Alumni Relations at Northeastern. And it is a pure joy to be able to provide today's um, webinar for uh, everyone attending and those that might be watching this later that um, due to our wonderful uh, merger with Mills College, we have access to so many great uh, pieces of what Mills College has had over the years. Um, this uh, presentation today, I'm gonna let the current director introduce herself, um, but I will say, um, again, to be able to uh, appreciate so many things from Mills College, uh, from our from our side of the country um, is just such a great benefit post uh, the merger from last year. Um, the Mills College Art Museum at Northeastern, um, I believe is open if people are able to get out there to the campus uh, for visits. But today we get to hear from Director Stephanie Hanner um, as to just what um, is inside. And uh, hopefully you'll all be able to appreciate it. Just so you know, this is being recorded. So it will be on our YouTube channel and I'll put the link to that. Um, it takes three to five business days for it to get uploaded. Um, so if you check next week, well, you can share the link with, with others. Stephanie, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate it. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for making time to hear more about the Mills College Art Museum today. Um, my background, I've been here as director of the Mills College Art Museum since 2009. Uh, my background is as a contemporary art historian. I have a PhD from the University of Texas in Austin, and my dissertation was on connections between art and technology um, in the U.S. post-World War II. Um, I my before coming here to Mills, I was a senior curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. Uh, so my background is really an interest in in artists um, and commissioning artists to create new work is a big part of what we do here at the museum. Um, what I'm going to do today is share my screen. Actually, maybe I'll go ahead and start that already. But what I'd like to do today is really um, introduce you to what we do here at the Mills College Art Museum, our exhibition program, um, our collections, how we're engaging students. Um, and I'm gonna give a little bit of history and then I'm gonna give some examples of some of the things that we've been doing at the museum. Um, you are also very welcome to um, let me know if you have any questions as I'm going through things. Um, feel free to raise your hand, feel free to shout out, um, happy to answer anything um, as we're going through. Let's see, here we go. Uh, so the Mills College Art Museum was founded in 1925. Um, it's always been, the building was, uh, has always been an art museum. Um, and since its inception, it's really been a hub for exploring art and ideas. And in particular, it's been a hub for supporting contemporary art practices and contemporary art exhibitions. This is an image that was taken when in 1925, when the gallery first opened. Um, we were the very first museum in Northern California to collect the work of contemporary artists, of living artists. Um, that sounds kind of weird to say now, since it's such a common thing for museums. Um, but at the time, it was kind of a radical choice uh, that the museum was really about supporting contemporary artists and the core of the collection that came in in 1925, which you can see installed in the museum here, um, was all new work by by Northern California artists. Um, the collection now spans about, um, we have about 12,000 objects in our collection, which is large for a small academic museum. Um, it's a diverse range of objects, both in terms of media, but in terms of time periods, we have works that go back from 3000 BC to things that were made just the past year. Um, some of the 
we also have a, a large range of cultures that are represented, um, a large number of um, Asian works, European works, South American works, and of course, American works, which are really a strength of the museum's collection. Um, we have very significant holdings of modernist, early 20th century modernist works on paper, um, in particular prints and drawings. We have a really stellar collection of German expressionist works in the collection. Photography is a big strength of our collection. Um, you may or may not know that uh, the San Francisco and the Bay Area was a hub in the early part of the 20th century for the development of modernist photography. Um, a lot of works by those types of artists are in our collection. Ceramics is another strength of our collection, and I'll give you some examples of things that we've done with that. Um, textiles, Native American baskets, and early 20th century California painting, which you see on the storage rack here. Um, we use the collection in numerous ways, and I'll talk about some of those um, as we go through this chat. Uh, this is just an installation image from our latest exhibition that was up this past fall called Shifting Terrains, which looked at landscape um, from across uh, disciplines and across time periods in our collection. Um, so we're thinking about using the collection in a variety of ways, including exhibitions for classes, working with students, working with researchers um, and artists as well. Um, for me, academic museums have a particular purpose, um, and I'm a really passionate advocate for academic museums. I really feel that we need to be laboratory spaces for research, experimentation, and innovation. It's really important that we're prioritizing cross-disciplinary approaches, both to art making and also to exhibition making, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of how we're doing that. Expanding access to art is really critical um, and promoting equity and inclusion is very important. We do that by championing traditionally underrecognized voices and perspectives, both through our exhibition practice, but also through our collecting as well. Um, for us, it's really important that we be student-centered as well as artist and community-centered. So almost everything that we're doing um, is really about those three, those three audiences. And above all, what we're trying to do is create meaningful impact um, through everything that we're doing. So I'd like to share a few examples of ways that we are doing that. There we go. Uh, so the first exhibition that I wanna to talk to you all about and share with you is an exhibition by an artist named Maria Elena Gonzalez that's called Tree Talk. And Maria Elena is a Cuban born artist. This is an exhibition we did right before COVID. Um, she's a Cuban born artist who shares her time between San Francisco and New York City. And Tree Talk was the culmination of a project that she started about 10 years ago when she was a faculty member at the Scohegan School of Art, which is in Maine. And um, all the faculty for that, it's a summer program, uh, live on campus. And every morning she would get up and have this amazing view, um, have her coffee, sitting in an Adirondack chair, looking over a lake. Um, and she created this simulacra of um, the experience through this video installation that was part of our exhibition. And in doing this, she really fell in love with the majestic birch trees that um, were throughout campus. And the Tree Talk project, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was, really, was really related to the trees on this campus. The project consists of three birch trees. So there were a um, series of trees that were taken down on the Scohegan campus. She selected three of them to do this project. And the artists removed the bark from each of the trees, laying them out into a grid, a kind of two-dimensional flattened grid. These trees are very, very large. They're about 50 feet long. So this grid, and I'll give you a sense of the detail here, um, quite large in our gallery space. 
Her interest in the trees really started with this very distinctive marking. So if you're familiar with birch trees, which, which many of you probably are living in the Northeast, um, they have these distinctive uh, markings, black markings that, that um, you can see here. And these are lenticels. So they are openings in the tree bark that allow the tree to actually breathe. It's the way that the oxygen um, and carbon dioxide uh, both come into and escape from the tree itself. And she was struck with the way that the markings looked like musical notes on a player piano roll. And so she came up with the idea of taking these trees. Um, again, I'm gonna just back up so you can see the overview here, taking the entire tree and transcribing the markings of the lenticels into a pattern that could be then used for actual player piano rolls. The goal was to actually be able to hear the tree breathe. So the tree bark served as the basis for these very large drawings, uh, their rubbings, of the tree bark, and then sections which she has kind of emphasized the lenticel structure here. And so you can kind of get a sense from these images, um, this connection to the player piano roles that she was interested in. Um, ultimately, um, the trees, and here's an installation shot, um, actually serve for individual player piano roles that we created with the artist for each of the trees. So each tree became its own role of music um, based on this process of transcribing the lenticels from the bark to the drawings to the player piano roles themselves. And we were actually able through the exhibition to not only uh, show the process of this for the artists, but to actually premiere um, performances of all three player piano roles for our audiences. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with old player pianos, but the very old kinds are pneumatic instruments. So you actually pump um, your feet and there's a bellows in the machine itself that sucks air through these openings in the player piano. So whenever a cut in the paper comes over one of these open holes, um, air is sucked through and that's where the player piano knows which key on the piano to depress, right? So each of these is a separate note, each cut, and then the length of each cut is the length of the note itself. Um, so there's a really nice analogy here between the mechanism of the player piano um, being these pneumatic machines and the sense that these trees are actually breathing through the cuts that she's transcribed. Um, you can see from the pattern here, it's a really complicated note structure, right? Um, it's impossible to actually play these with human fingers and human hands. It's just too complicated. Um, and we had actually had conversations with the artist where she was very interested in seeing if there was some way that we could work with the music department to actually play these on a regular piano. Um, folks that we consulted said, absolutely not. Uh, this is too complicated. We cannot do this. But we were able to do it through the player piano itself. Um, and I'm going to show you a snippet of what one of these sounds like. So each of the trees really had its own personality. Um, 
because if you think about it, each one has its different kind of rhythmic uh, sensibility of how these lenticels are placed um, and grow within the tree itself. Um, so each one had its own rhythm and its own structure. And it was really fun to be able to actually hear what these trees sound like um, and their own voices that are coming through through this process. So as I mentioned, we did go to the music department to try to see if we could have uh, these trees played on a regular piano. Um, we were told no, that that wouldn't work, but we did find two graduate students who worked with us and worked with the artists to come up with ensemble performances that were performed in the museum based off of the visual materials that the artists had provided. So the musicians, the grad students use both the bark images, the rubbings, the note structure from the player pianos to create what they were calling uh, visual scores. And you see an example of that here. So rather than a note to note transcription, uh, which the player piano presentation was, these were more um, experimental in that the musicians were using visual pieces of, of the artwork itself to be cues for the kinds of um, musical choices that they were making in their performances. Um, and here's what the performances actually looked like in our space. So it was a really wonderful way of bringing in other disciplines into the process for the artist. Um, it was a way for her to see the trees and to understand the work that she was doing from a different perspective. And it was a great opportunity for our audience to kind of hear and see the trees from multiple perspectives. Um, it was a really fun project that we were able to do. So one of the things that we also do in our exhibition project is not only about commissioning artists to create new work, figure out ways of using faculty, students, and ideas that are, are being taught and occurring on our campus, is we often commission artists to work with our collection directly. And so for Kari Marbo, who is a Bay Area ceramicist, um, social practice artist, she created an exhibition project called um, Duplicating Daniel. So Kari's work is very driven by research and archival research in particular. She's a ceramicist um, who was teaching ceramics here at Mills College. She would bring her students into the museum archive. We have a really wonderful collection of ceramics here in the museum. A lot of our ceramics are mid 20th century, so some from the 50s up through the 80s, Northern California artists. Um, Northern California was during that period um, an incredibly important experimental hub for ceramics and really was an area in which ceramics move from being pots and kind of functional objects and de merely decorative objects to ceramics becoming part of a broader conversation about what sculpture could be. So Kari was interested in having her students come um, do research on works in our collection, come into our archives. Our archives are filled with exhibition notes from shows that have happened here, information about the artists from when the works came into the collection, information about donors who gave works to the collection. And she wanted them to understand how collections were built, what information was stored at museums, and why these kinds of information, um, as well as the objects, could actually tell us more about the history of the object and about the give meaning to the artists in their process. Um, so in the process of doing this, she found um, an old cataloging box, which I have to say no museum director ever wants to see. This is a box of old catalog cards um, that says deaccession, missing or stolen works right on it. 
Um, of course, she went right for this and was like, let me look at what's in here. Um, if you're not familiar with the term deaccessioned, when works of art come into a museum collection, the term for that process is called accessioning. And when works of art leave um, a museum's collection or sold because they no longer are part of the purview of a collection, for, for example, or something maybe is, um, for prints, for example, you may, may have multiple copies of the same thing and you just need the one. Deaccessioning is a way of, of um, a sanctioned way of removing work uh, from a collection. So deaccessioned works, I'm not so worried about. The missing or stolen works were the ones of concern. Um, she, of course, found um, one piece that she built a whole work around. Uh, we, about 10 years ago, um, started a huge digitizing project for our collection. So we got a major grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences um, in New York, which is a federal granting organization. Uh, they gave us money to set up um, a digitizing process for our collection. And so in the process of doing that work, because we are actually handling every object in our collection, we have actually found many of the works that were missing or actually labeled as stolen from our collection. So, um, and we're actually continuing to find works uh, today as <clears throat> Northeastern we are um, going through dorm rooms and other kinds of spaces on campus that are getting renovated and we're finding works in the collection that we didn't know had been on view in living room spaces and library spaces and different things in dorm rooms that are now coming back to the collection. So the missing part is not as scary as it sounds, but um, just seeing this collection in this card catalog box, um, is not something that you want to see. Uh, but one of the items that Kari found in that box <clears throat> was this particular sculpture by Daniel Rhodes. And uh, Daniel Rhodes, <clears throat> excuse me, was a very influential ceramicist in the mid part of the 20th century. So he was really active from the 1940s to about the 1970s. Um, he was a ceramicist who started on the East Coast, ended up his career in California. He wrote a very important and influential book about ceramics um, glazes that's actually still in print and still being used um, by ceramicists today. The only information that we had about this particular piece was some very basic cataloging information. So we knew it was an untitled work by Daniel Rhodes. We knew it was ceramic. We knew the dimensions of it, or at least the height and the width and the depth of it. Um, the only image we have of the piece is this, which is a really poor quality, photocopy that came out of a master's thesis that somebody had done in the 1970s about the ceramics collection at the Mills College Art Museum. So for a sculptural piece of ceramics, we don't know what the back of it looks like. We don't know what the sides of it looks like. We don't know the color of it. We don't know exactly the materials or how it was made. So Kari proposed a project where she would research the Daniel Rhodes piece she would research his process and his impact in the world of ceramics, and that she would create a work based off of that research that would come back into the museum's collection to replace the missing work. Great idea. Let's do that. It, of course, became a much larger exhibition project that we did. Um, she did a whole series of oral histories with variety of folks who were familiar with, either had known Daniel Rhodes in person um, or were very familiar with his work. Uh, this is a local ceramic sculptor, Arthur Gonzalez, who's describing to Kari the kind of general shape of Daniel Rhodes' pieces. And then in the middle is her version of what that would look like, her interpretation. She did a lot of research with 
and experimented with a variety of materials and techniques, things that she learned from her research on his work and from these conversations that she was having with other ceramicists. Um, this is from the exhibition display and installation image. The small objects on the table are all prototypes of what she called kickstands. So Kari, I'm just gonna back up a couple of slides. So Kari realized that the only, the only version of the sculpture that we have is this photocopy. So if you wanted to actually show, show the work as a three-dimensional piece, it only exists in two-dimensional form currently. So in order to show it, it would need some kind of support or what she called a kickstand, like for a bicycle, right? That you would, um, that you would use to kind of make it freestanding. So all of these are small little prototypes of what a kind of two-dimensional piece and then a kickstand would be for each one. So you're, you're starting to get a sense of her, um, both humor and how she was approaching this and just a sense of experimentation. Um, Kari did extensive research, both at Alfred University in New York, where Rhodes had taught for many years, and also at Greenwich House Pottery in New York, um, where he had also taught as well. So there was a lot of archival material that was included in the exhibition. One of the most interesting parts for me that came out of her research was a new understanding of this artist uh, whose name is Minnie Nagoro. And Minnie Nagoro was um, uh, ja of Japanese descent. She and her family lived in Los Angeles and during World War II, she was attending UCLA. And when she and in her entire family were moved to an internment camp in Montana, so during World War II, J uh, Daniel Rhodes, and this is actually a photograph of Minnie Nagoro and Daniel Rhodes at the internment camp. Daniel Rhodes was hired by the US government to teach ceramics in Montana at this camp. And the goal was, or his mission um, was to teach the residents of the camp to create dinnerware for US troops. Um, he, instead of doing that, taught fine art ceramics to the residents at this camp. Um, Minnie Nagoro became a ceramicist as a result of it. She ended up starting the ceramics department at the University of Connecticut and went on to have a really amazing career um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s based off of this initial um, mentorship uh, through her time at this internment camp um, in So part of what I really love about this project is, you know, we get to see this amazing story of Minnie Nakoro. Um, we get to really understand if, you know, the project started as an attempt to be transparent about where museum collections come from, um, how museum collections are built, um, how museum collections change over time. It was a really wonderfully generative project uh, that really illuminated the connections between East Coast and West Coast ceramics. Again, here in the Bay Area, we tend to know the Bay Area story of it. Daniel Rose was this bridge to a much larger understanding about American ceramics. Um, and the change that was happening in ceramics at that moment in time. It gave new context and information to artists in our collection. I never would have known this about Minnie Nagoro if um, Kari's project hadn't brought it to light. And it really allowed Kari to, to create an entirely new body of work that was based on the information that she um, gleaned from this project. So just in case you're wondering what we replace the missing Pete, Daniel Rhodes piece with, we actually brought in two of Kari's works into our collection. So these are the two that we ended up bringing in. 
Other ways that we are using our collection um, is through student curated exhibitions. So I, for the past 10 years, have been teaching a curatorial practices class in which we have a small group of, of students who are working together to co-curate an exhibition using works from our collection to do that. Um, it's been a really wonderful way of seeing our collection through student eyes and sort of understanding what their interests are and what their priorities are, which has been nice. State of Convergence was uh, one of the recent exhibitions that we did. It featured contemporary and historical work by Bay Area artists in order to highlight Northern California as both a site of resistance but also a site of abundance and a site of celebration. Some of the examples of works from that show that the students showcase were works by Rupert Garcia, um, an important Chicana or Chicano artist here in the Bay Area. This work, uh, print in our collection, Calavera Crystal Ball, that was done in 1992, uh, is a political work that directly critiques the impact of colonialism in California. So um, Garcia is using this kind of stylized image of Christopher Columbus. Um, the handprint is a reference to um, indigenous uh, hand painting, um, both markers on their own bodies, but on their horses as well. And then, of course, the skull here as an indication of the impact of colonialism on Native peoples in California. Other works like Carmen, this print by Carmen Lomas Garza, um, really celebrate Chicana life. Um, this is a birthday party and the kind of intersection of of family and different generations of Chicana family in the in the Bay Area. Uh, for these student exhibitions, we always do a uh, publication. And so we've been doing digital publications where we've been beta testing uh, publication software that was, was produced by the Getty. Um, so this has actually been a really great way for us to produce online publications for students that, that highlight student work and student um, student research. So this is just spread from the the catalog that we did for for state of convergence. Um, it's a really nice way for students to get real world experience about not only curating, but interpretation of work of art. And for us, it's been great because the students always find new ways of thinking about works in our collection. This is all becomes part of the information that we make public about our collection on our website as well. So it has multiple uses and uh, kind of multiple purposes, which has been really, really rewarding as well. The students in the class have also been involved in a project that we started recently that I'm really excited to continue, which is a student acquisition project. So the students in the class are given a small budget to work with. So it comes from our acquisition endowment. Um, they There are certain protocols and kind of limits that they have in terms of thinking about acquisitions, but they have to pick and um, present and justify works that could help diversify our collection that are within this budget. And they're also given um, a kind of limited list of local galleries, um, print shops, and other arts producers in the Bay Area. Because what a big part of this is what we really want students to see is how, again, how collections are built what kind of agency you can have as a curator or a member of a museum in terms of building those collections, um, how your resources can help the artists and the artistic economy and community um, in your local area, 
So Adriana Adams' screen print weekly routine is one of the pieces that came into the collection. Um, again, our, our, the students have to pick works, um, justify them, and present them to a collections committee that's made up of museum staff and related faculty. Um, and then the collections committee votes on which pieces they want to accept and spend money on to bring into the co collection. Um, so again, it's this really um, rewarding project. It really allows students to understand that they too can have agency and, you know, if they're pursuing a museum career, that there are ways that they too can help create um, what future generations are going to see in an exhibition or understand how collections have meaning um, and how collections and museums can have impact in a very direct way. Um, so that's been a really, really great project. We've brought in, I think, about 25 works uh, through that student acquisition project. Another really important part of what we do in our exhibition program, um, and also thinking about community engagement, is through our Artists in Residence program. So for the past seven, I think seven or eight years, we the museum has had a partnership with our studio art program, where we have brought in two to three local artists, um, so Bay Area artists, to come for artist residencies on our campus. So they spend six to nine months with us. They have access to studio space um, here on campus. They work directly with both our undergraduates and our graduate students. They have access to all of the making facilities on campus. So we have a really wonderful ceramic studio, um, all kinds of you know metal shop, woodshop, photography studios. Um, they're also, we specifically pick artists who we know are going to engage in a cross-disciplinary way with faculty on campus. Um, and so we're also really interested in artists who are really thinking about social justice themes and ways of engaging with community, whether that be the community here on our campus or the community off campus. So the piece that's on the screen right now is by Indira Allegra uh, called Open Casket. And it's really a memorial piece for people who've lost loved ones to police violence over the past five, six years. Viewers are invited, it's a large installation. Viewers are invited to enter the space, stand within the stone circle um, and have a very immersive experience. Um, I'll show you some details, but this is stone that has speakers. So there's a sound component coming from the stone ring. And then up above along the wall here is an immersive video installation. So I'll show you a couple of details. Uh, so the stone is made of crushed marble and granite. So these are the same materials that are traditionally used for headstones and memorials. Uh, within the stone ring is a series of speakers that have abstracted and edited clips of audio of family members who've lost loved ones to um, police violence. So she's using clips that she's finding on the internet that are news clips that are shown over and over and over again, um, depicting interviews um, and different points of, of news intersection with, with families who are grieving. The surrounding video is um, also found news footage of interviews with family members. Um, they're, they're again abstracted and edited and the patterning is meant to evoke the weaving structure of crepe, which is a material that is commonly used and traditionally used as a casket upholstery fabric. 
um, incredibly powerful piece. This was done right before um, right before the pandemic and right before uh, the George Floyd um, murders. And but this this sense of power of loss, um, and particularly for the Black community, was something that Indira was um, was very engaged with and continues to be engaged with. Uh, in her work today. Um, other artists, we, big part of our artists in residence program is also thinking about not only what we're doing in the exhibition. So our, I think I forgot to say that our artists are with us for six to nine months. And then we do an exhibition with them that features the new work that they create while they're on site. Uh, some of the work is actually off site, which is actually really exciting and a great way for us to partner with different uh, community partners in the Bay Area as well. So one of our artists in residence, Connie Hockaday, created a project that was in collaboration with the San Francisco arts organization called Southern Exposure. Um, and this was a performance and lecture that Connie did on the ferry uh, going back and forth between San Francisco and Oakland. Um, it was an absolutely freezing day in January. You can see the nice fog of the Bay Area here. Um, Connie giving her lecture and everybody who's participating has headphones on so that we can hear what she's saying. Um, her work is really about water rights and access and our relationship to waterways and urban spaces, who has access, who doesn't. Much like Boston, um, the Bay Area, of course, is inundated with different types of bays, the ocean. Um, we are a community that is very, very connected to water, yet there's our government system and private entities put barriers in place that limit access to waterways um, in our area. So Connie really gave this amazing history of the Bay Area Bay um, and some of the kinds of unseen and undercurrents of, again, these relationships about who has access and who doesn't have access uh, to waterways. Most recently, um, in terms of offsite projects, we worked with our artist in residence, Christy Chan, on a piece called Dear America. And Chrissy, this was in direct response to Asian American violence in the Bay Area during the pandemic. And Christy commissioned American artists, actually a whole slew of local uh, American national artists and international artists to create images that were projected very large scale. So this is about six stories high on a building in downtown Oakland. Um, these were projected both in Oakland, San Jose, and San Francisco, um, sometimes on sanctioned sites, most often on unsanctioned sites. So there was kind of guerrilla performances, if you will. Uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and they were text and images that were in solidarity with the Asian American community in the Bay Area. Um, and this was also in partnership with the Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco and the nonprofit group Stand with Asian Americans. Um, so again, Partnerships for us are a really important way that we can um, leverage the work that we're doing here at the Art Museum, um, connect artists to larger communities, um, and connect uh, larger audiences to the work that we're doing here on, on our campus. One last area that I want to talk about with the museum is professional development for students. Um, we have always had a very rigorous professional development uh, program for students and our students often come in and work with us from the time that they're freshmen or sophomores they are with us three or four years. We work with graduate students as well. One of the things that I'm very excited about now that we're part of Northeastern is having co-op students at the art museum. Um, our students work with us in a variety of capacities. They are our gallery assistants. 
Um, so there are front of house uh, visitor services folks. Uh, they work with us as publicity assistants as well. And we have teams of students who work with us as collection assistants. Um, so they work directly with our museum staff to help catalog and store work. They're learning best practices about how to handle artwork. Um, storage and digitization is a big part of it. So when we digitize our collection, again, we have about 12,000 objects, all of which have been digitized, all of which were photographed by students. Um, so our students worked in teams um, and we would do sections of the collection at, at one time. They worked with our photography folks in the photography department to get um, trained in both how to use the cameras, but also post-production work as well. They also got trained in art handling and as part of that, um, rehousing our entire collection too. So uh, students have been really, really integral in, in every aspect of the museum and what we're doing. Um, one of the projects that I'm particularly interested in having our co-op students working with us is a large uh, Cal NAGPRA project that we're working on. Cal NAGPRA stands for the California Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. There is a federal NAGPRA that you might have heard of, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, this is the state of California's version of it. They are requiring all California institutions that hold objects or items by California Native American tribes to create an inventory and summary of all of those items that are going on a statewide website, and then to contact all affiliated California Native American tribes to start consultation about properly identifying the works and uh, working with those tribes about potential repatriation of those works. Um, so we hired uh, about a year ago, um, Jesse, who's an independent um, anthropologist to come in to help us with our cataloging. We have about 150 or so Native California, Native American baskets in our collection um, that fall under the purview of this Cal NAGPRA Act. We um, worked with Jesse to, again, improve our cataloging. Um, the information, most of the baskets came into the collection through donors. So we have very limited information about provenance. So where, where these pieces um, came from in California, how they were acquired, um, any kind of handling or, or anything about contamination that, um, that is related to them with very, very little information. So Jesse was helpful in helping us create these inventories and summaries that we could submit. We're now in the process of actually having conversations with tribes, affiliated tribes, um, we're in the summer going to be having our first site visit with tribes from Yosemite who are coming to look and identify works. And then we'll continue those conversations um, moving forward. So really excited again to have students working with this. This is a long-term project. It's not something that's gonna be done uh, quickly, but it, it's something that um, will have enormous impact and is a very important project for us to be doing and to be able to share that with students, I think is really exciting. So I hope these examples of exhibitions, um, how we're using our collection, how we're working with students gives you a kind of overview about what we do here at the Art Museum. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see all of you too. And um, if anybody is here on Oakland, uh, please come visit. Uh, let me know when you're coming. Happy to talk to everybody and to give you a little bit more information or a tour of what we do here. And thank you.
Stephanie, thank you so much. I, uh, th we had one question, but again, one of our mills colleagues, Sarah, jumped right in there to answer. Awesome. Um, basically a, a mailing list for museum events, as well as the hours that the museum is open. And she shared the link. If everybody wants to know, um, there's the link in the chat and I can, I can copy it again. But what are the hours? I'm just curious. Yeah, we're open every day but Monday, um, and we're open 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., and on Wednesdays, we're open late until 7.30 p.m., so um, yeah, if you're on campus, uh, feel free to stop by. Uh, currently, we have our MFA exhibition up, so um, our MFA thesis show, and awesome. uh, somebody asked about the contact. Um, you're welcome to email me. It's s.hainer at northeastern.edu. And I'll put that in the chat too. Great. Thank you. Scott. Um, I just, uh, before people, if people have questions, feel free to unmute and, and, and we can take those. Um, I'm just so impressed with it. For those of you that may not be aware, Mills College at, at Northeastern has an incredible tradition of um, diving into social justice issues that's been a, a pillar of, of their existence and, and please anybody correct me if I'm if I'm misspeaking um but how that has woven into all those projects that you've shared is just uh, each one you share and I'm like it's so foundational and and it was just so impressive the different ways art can take that on for us and help us express I, I just that was my takeaway from the whole time I don't know if other people were, were uh, impressed with that um but really people Sarah's asking, how does the NAGRA Act work? Can you see it, Stephanie? I don't want to, yes. do you need to return baskets to qualified Native Americans who ask for them? And just in case you're yes, not looking at your chat, do. I'm just repeating we it. We do. Yes, we do. Um, so NAGRA, the 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 impetus for it, so NAGPRA, the federal on the federal level, um, that was that act was established in the early 1990s. And the the Really, the most important part of that is returning um, human remains and funerary ob items uh, to tribes. We as an art museum, we do not have materials like that, but we do have baskets, ceramics, and other objects that can be seen as forms of cultural patrimony, which does um, fall with under the within the NAGPRA purview. So that is ultimately um, what we're finding out from the tribes that we're consulting with mm -hmm. is um, who will be asking for repatriation and repatriation of what items. Um, we have a range of types of baskets in our collection, some that clearly were bought as souvenirs, um, others that clearly have sign of ceremonial use, um, others that are cooking implements, um, and a whole wide kind of range of different types of items. So um, that's why these consultations are really important and the site visits are really important, not only to better identify what we have, um, but to better understand the importance of those um, from a cultural perspective for those tribe members. And so, um, yes, repatriation um, will likely happen for a number of the works in the collection. Great. Lawrence just mentioned a wonderful introduction and thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming and uh, staying with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cut anybody off if, you know, we have a minute or two left, but I don't see any, any quick typers in the chat. Um, but again, Stephanie, everyone that her email address is in the chat. So if you have, have questions afterwards, this has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel sometime early next week. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining. I know there was a little difficulty, um, for some of you to get on. I apologize. I've got to reach out to our Zoom contact about that. Um, I also want to make sure everyone's aware that we will have three more NU at Noon events for our late spring edition to the semester. Um, we'll have another presentation on May 23rd at the Burlington campus, then our Red Sox event on June 3rd, and then Northeastern Night at the Pops will be June 8th. Then you'll all be getting more information via email on those. Um, again, I, th I, I think Brian is behind the Zoom user. Um, excellent presentation on breadth of the academic and artistic filled student experience. What
fields do students pursue? That's a great ending question. Oh, yeah. Um, there's such a wide range of types of um, museum fields for folks to pursue. And we have had students go on to doing everything from um, publicity to publications for museums to collection research to curating um, to museum directors. So there's a really wide range of opportunities for students within the museum field. And it doesn't have to be exclusively an art museum field either. So um, there's a lot of um, applied knowledge that, that helps students moving forward for sure. That's yeah, awesome. Um, Amanda Harper, who I think I've met, I've, I've met some of Mills alumni. Um, she's just sharing her gratitude too, especially for um, everything that's currently going on. For those of you that weren't aware, um, Mills celebrated their commencement this past Sunday. Uh, so, wow, we're, we're fully in that season. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I will send out the link uh, for everybody to enjoy, as well as for, for those that may not have been able to attend. And uh, you can always check out our YouTube channel. Um, uh, I'll put that link in, I believe, but up top. Uh, for anybody to to log on to, there's no password protection there. You can check it out. And this, as well as other recorded uh, programs that we've had, will be listed there. So thank you again, everyone. Stephanie, thank you. We'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. Take care. Bye-bye.